I'll begin with, um, with introductions. Welcome to the SOAS Southeast Asian Seminars. Um, this is one of our midday seminars that we hold earlier in the UK time and so we can have more of a Southeast Asian audience. Um, with me today, or with us today is Dr. Orlando Woods, who's an Associate Professor of Geography and Lee Kong Chung, Fellow at the College of Integrative Studies, Singapore Management University. He's published more than 70 journal articles, books, and book chapters on topics related to religion, urban culture, smart cities, and digital transformation in South and Southeast Asia. He holds a BA and PhD uh, in geography from University College London and the National University of Singapore, respectively. And he'll be talking today on the worlding and provincializing of Singapore as a smart nation. We'll hold questions for the very, very end. Uh, if you can add your questions into the uh, Q&A box, uh, and then I will uh, field them to the speaker at the end. Uh, I'd like to invite you to speak now, Dr. Woods. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. And uh, thank you, everyone, for um, taking this uh, hour out of your precious lunchtime to listen to me talk a little bit about Singapore. Um, I'm delighted to be, be talking to you guys as SOAS. Uh, I don't know whether you're students or, or you know, faculty or, or staff or whatever it may be. Um, but as Mike mentioned, I did my undergraduate degree at UCL, so obviously right next to where you guys are based. Um, so I've spent many a very happy evening at your student union, and, and you know, SOAS is a very fond place uh, in my heart. Um, okay, let me just share my screen. Um, okay, you should be able to see a nice, bright, technicolor slide. Yep, okay. Um, right, okay, so welcome uh, to Singapore. I'm in Singapore and it's absolutely uh, miserable here today. Um, but I what I want to talk to you about uh, this evening, my time, midday, your time, um, is some research that I've been working on for about the past um, sort of six or seven years or so, which is looking at um, the idea of the smart city. Um, in Singapore, we call it the smart nation. Um, over the past six years, I've been working pretty much just on Singapore as, uh, as a case study. Um, but actually recently, just um, last year, the middle of last year, I got a, a decent sized grant to extend this research and actually look at Singapore's place uh, in the region and the development of smart cities uh, throughout Southeast Asia. Um, so if you want, I can talk a little bit more about that, seeing as some of you may be specialists in, in different Southeast Asian countries, not necessarily um, Singapore. Um, I also understand that that none of you, or my assumption, I should say, is that none of you here are really sort of urban studies uh, specialists or, or experts. You're more sort of uh, interested in, in region and maybe have specific specialisms in anthropology or, or politics or history or whatever it may be. Um, and so as a result of that, I've positioned this talk. Um, so it's it's kind of what I'm going to do is basically just present empirical data and then uh, talk through some of the, the ramifications of the, the findings uh, that way. Um, so I'm not going to go, you know, very heavy on you. Um, I'm going to sort of more present the empirical case um, about Singapore as a smart nation and the world in, and provincializing relationships. Okay, I understand I've got, well, the, the session is like an hour, um, of which I plan to speak for about 45 minutes, leaving about 15 minutes for Q&A. I will tell you now, I always overrun. So um, if I start speeding up uh, aggressively towards the end and, and flying through things, um, this is just my style. So, so don't take it personally. And, and, you know, uh, it's just me. So, so you know, I apologize for that in advance. Okay, so um, to get started, I want to show you this image here. Um, usually when I give this presentation, I ask people two questions. If I'm, if I'm giving it live, I ask everyone two questions. One is, who is this man? And the second is, what, he, what is he doing? Or what do you think he's doing? Um, for those of you that know a little bit about Singapore, I'll answer those questions for you so, so we don't have to go through these awkward silences and stuff. Um, I'll answer those, those two questions for you. So for those of you that know a little bit about Singapore, you will immediately recognize this man as Lee Sien Lung, right? He is the uh, son, the eldest son of our founding prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, he's the current incumbent prime minister of Singapore. Um, and so he's quite an important guy. He's our head of state, right? He's our, he's our prime minister. Um, so this is him in his office, uh, happily tapping away at his laptop, but, you know, smiling for some reason. Um, and so the question, the, the second question I asked him, what is he doing? He's actually coding. He's, uh, he's writing C++ script. Um, and what he's doing is he's uh, developing a program which is called Sudoku Solver. 
Um, and so I'm sure many of you know the, the sort of number puzzles, Sudoku, where you have to fit numbers in boxes and rows and lines and stuff like that. And so what he did is he actually created this uh, computer program where it would solve Sudoku puzzles for you. Um, what he did is he, he developed this program and then he put the source code on his Facebook page to share it with anybody uh, who, who is interested in what he does. So why I'm sort of starting with this and why I'm sharing it with you is because this to me is very much symptomatic of what Singapore as a smart nation, as a smart city is all about, which is the guy at the very top, the head of government being deeply personally invested in technology and being technology literate. And that whole ethos, that mindset, cascading down from the very top um, to, to many, not most, many echelons of society as well. Um, you can ask in the UK, uh, Rishi Sunak, I, I don't know, does he know how to code? Would he put, put you know, source codes on, on his Facebook page? I don't know, maybe he does. Um, but certainly, I think in most countries, most cities around the world, this is quite a unique thing. And so it sort of sets the, case, the Singapore case apart uh, from the very house. Okay, so bear that in mind. I'll, I'll show you this image again a little bit later. Let me just quickly introduce the projects that this specific uh, uh, presentation stems from. Um, so this is uh, actually from a project which is called Smart Cities in Global Comparative Perspective welding and provincializing relationships. Um, it was very generally, generously funded by SHRC, which is, uh, for those of you that do collaborate with people in Canada or know anything about Canada, Canada funding landscape, um, this is quite a common grant. Um, the project team is not just myself, but, uh, but I've been working on this with two colleagues, um, one from SMU, Professor Lily Kong, uh, and another colleague from NUS, Professor Tim Bunnell. Um, so this is, this is sort of the most recent project that we've been working on. Um, we did a bunch of interviews, even 31 interviews um, from about, I think it was 2019 until 2021, so over a two-year period, basically over the COVID period. So, so most of the interviews we did uh, were over Zoom. We interviewed 31 people from both the public and private sectors. Um, what was maybe unique about our sample is that we, we had access to some incredibly senior people. So, what arguably the interview that I'm most proud of is we actually interviewed the, the CEO of DBS Bank. So for those of you that know anything about banks in, in sort of Southeast Asia, Hong Kong as well, um, one of the biggest banks is DBS, the Development Bank of Singapore. Um, so we actually interviewed the, the CEO of DBS, which is a pretty incredible kind of uh, access and, and insights that he could provide. Why you, you might be thinking like, why, why, why interview a head of a bank like a project about smart cities? Um, and that is, uh, and you know, arguably the question could apply to any private sector or stakeholder. Why bother interviewing them? Why don't you just interview government people? Um, well, for those of you that know anything about Singapore, the public-private distinction is quite blurred. Um, and you do have a lot of organizations which sort of straddle both in weird and wonderful ways. And DBS is a good example of that. I mean, it's Singapore's largest bank, but its majority shareholder is actually Temasek, which is uh, Singapore's sovereign wealth. Okay. Yeah, and so in some of the examples of the organizations that we spoke to, GovTech and SMDGO, I'll explain later what these uh, organizations are, um, but they're integral sort of government agencies for realizing or for implementing smart city related uh, projects. So that's the, the project that this presentation is, is uh, building on. Um, as I said, since sort of the middle of last year, I've received another grant to actually take this, extend this project out to the region. And so we're looking at my research team and I are looking at uh, not just Singapore, but also Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam, and looking at Singapore's role in the development of smart cities in these other cities throughout Southeast Asia. So as I said, I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit more about that in the q and if anyone has any interest. Okay, um, quickly, let me just, uh, this, this is just to sort of show that I, I, I am taking this seriously academically. So um, what I'm going to show you uh, today is, is just data, basically. Um, but there are also two, three papers so far that have come out of this um, project. One of them is under revision, two of them are on the first round review, and obviously I'm hoping that all of them will eventually get published. I'm just going to give you the titles, just so you have an idea of the kind of theoretical contributions we're making through this work. Um, so the first one is called, this one's actually under revision right now, 
in sourcing the smart city, assembling an idea technical ecosystem of skills, talents, and civic mindedness in Singapore. So actually a lot of the, the themes from this paper I'll be touching on later today. The second one is my favorite. It's the most sort of innovative, and it's looking at actually Singapore's island geography and the uniqueness of its island geography. Obviously, as a geographer, that sort of excites me. Um, and so looking at actually this idea of island platforms, the island is a platform, uh, and the hyper-terrestrialization of Singapore's smart city state. Quite a, a sexy title, I think you agree. That paper's on the review, first round review right now. And then the final one is about the state-led platformization of financial services, uh, this idea of frictionless ecosystems and the expansive projects of smartness in Singapore. Again, I will, I will right at the end, I'll give a very quick sort of case study of what I mean by this idea of the platformization of financial services, which is again quite a, a thing that's quite unique to Singapore, uh, state-led platformization. Okay, so those are so far, those are the kind of more theoretical published outputs that are in the pipeline uh, to, to come out. Um, and a lot of the, the data that I'll be presenting to you, they, um, they feed into each of these three papers in different ways. Okay, um, what I want to talk to you about today are three things. Um, firstly, the role of centralization, the importance of centralization in realizing this master's in Singapore. Second, the role of insourcing. And as I said, the, you know, the first paper that's on the revision, that's very much about this idea of insourcing. And, and then thirdly, this idea of reimagining, reimagining what, what smartness might mean, what a smart city might mean. And that speaks to, to kind of the third paper that's, that's under review. So first of all, this idea of centralization. Okay, I'm going to start by, by probably patronizing a lot of you, which is showing you this map. Uh, so if any of you don't know, um, this is what Singapore looks like. Uh, this is a map of Singapore. We are an island. Uh, we are a tiny island. We, we measure about 50 kilometers across, so east to west about 50 kilometers. North to south, we're about 27 kilometers. Um, our land mass is about 730 kilometers squared, although it's always growing because we're always claiming land back from the sea. Um, but, but we're tiny, uh, we're tiny, we're insignificant, um, but that gives us a lot of advantages when it comes to realizing the, what it means to be a smart city. Um, I should also say that we're located uh, just to the south of the uh, peninsula of Malaysia, so, so just across the waterway there to the north, that's Malaysia, and then Indonesian islands surround us to the south, east and west. So we're surrounded by the countries, but we as Singapore are an island uh, within, within uh, the Malay archipelago. So why, why am I showing you this? Why am I sort of uh, impressing upon you the importance of Singapore's island geography and its small size? Well, these are two fundamental characteristics that actually lend themselves huge advantages to, to realizing the, the smart nation. And how we think about these is in terms of vertical and horizontal integration, right? So in terms of horizontal integration, what we're talking about here is how different government departments become, uh, it's very easy for them to become very well integrated because they're so small, right? Because a lot of what you do, whether it's planning roads or planning housing or planning electricity pipelines or, or water pipelines or whatever else it may be, they're all sort of talking to each other all the time because we're so dense and everything is sort of collapsed on top of each other. That actually create, creates a lot of advantages because if one uh, ministry or agency or organization is doing something, by default, almost, they have to be, in, be doing it in conversation with other ministries or agencies or organizations. They cannot do it in isolation of each other. Think about much bigger countries, which is arguably just about any other country in the world, and um, they can do that. Or the, the, because you don't have the, the pressure of density, the pressure of crowding, um, you do not necessarily have to operate or interoperate together. Right. So you see many more cases of organizations working in silos. And so in terms of harnessing the benefits of digital technology, which is what smart cities is all about, actually the importance is this idea of data silos, right? And so that's one of the main barriers to sort of the realization of urban smartness in many, many systems around the world is that data is siloed and it's not shared between departments and it's not shared within organizations and people are sort of very territorial about it. Not so in Singapore, because of this idea of horizontal integration, 
we have a very shared data landscape where actually um, this data that's being produced and the, the value, the potential value of digital technologies is maximized uh, massively. That's one thing. That's that's sort of a function of this small, compact size the island geography. The second characteristic that I mentioned just now is this idea of vertical integration. Right? So this is, I don't know if it's more important, it's equally as important as horizontal integration, but this is speaking to the idea that in Singapore, we only have one layer of government. We are a city state, right? So you've got the national level, and then you've got the urban sort of city level, they are one and the same thing. Right? We do not have multiple layers of government. We might have a, a sort of local council, a municipal urban government, you know, the, the city of London or whatever it may be. Uh, on top of that, maybe a, a regional government, on top of that, the national government. And at each of those layers, you've got various levels and various degrees of disconnect and, you know, political infighting and people not talking to each other and decisions getting lost in translation and all this kind of stuff. There's a huge amount of complexity that comes with having a, a heavily stacked political bureaucracy. Again, this is simply a virtue of our small size. We only need one layer of government, so it'd be completely inefficient to have uh, multiple sub layers. But it's also a huge advantage because we have this centralization of decision making. Again, think back to that picture I showed you right in the beginning, where our head of state, Lucien Lung, is the guy coding, is a guy sort of uh, that knows technology, and that ethos very quickly uh, uh, permeates down. So all layers of government. It does not get lost in the upper echelons of decision making and things like that. Okay, so as I said, I, I, I'm patronizing you with this map, but hopefully it provides a little bit of uh, sort of more fundamental understanding as to why Singapore is a paradigmatic successful case study of a smart system. So these are just some, some data, some quotes to sort of support what I've just said. So on the um, left, as you look at the screen, this is the permanent secretary of SNDG. Again, I will explain what these organizations are, um, I think next slide. Um, so what he says is that when I talk to other countries where they have federal level, provincial level, county level, city level, these different levels of government, right? He has difficulties understanding how people navigate three, four, five layers of government, how responsibilities and power are spread out into these different levels of government. Um, so for them, smart cities are essentially municipal services, very localized. They do not have that national level vision or ideology behind them. Um, and on the right, as you look at the screen, this is the CEO of DDS saying, um, we're, we're small enough so that uh, we can bring everyone together. Other countries can't do that. If you're 200 million people, it's very hard. We're a 5 million person country. We've got a very progressive public sector. We can actually get people to work together. That idea of horizontal integration, getting different ministries, different agencies uh, to overcome the organizational silos and barriers and to actually work together to, to realize projects. Okay, so what I want to argue is that actually in academic literature on the smart city, it's it's actually very recent. It's only, you know, in terms of academic circles, we've only really been talking about the smart city for about the past 10 years or so. Right. This is largely a response to movements in the private sector where companies like IBM, IBM Cisco, Siemens, uh, Natalie, Google, and, and, and Amazon Web Services and, and players like that, when they started to get in, they started to realize that actually the city is a huge market and smart city solutions is a huge market for them. So there's a lot of potential. Um, so what they did is they started to develop and package all these smart city solutions and they made it a thing. Right? And they, they sort of went in there and tried to sell these things to, to governments around the world. So it's only in the past sort of 10 years that academics have caught on to this and started to um, address and to develop this discourse around the smart system. But what I want to argue is actually in Singapore, the, we have what I call the long tail of smartness. So it goes back a very, very, very long time. Okay? If you ask me, I would actually, my sort of, genealogical approach of the Michel Foucault, I'd actually trace it back to 1981, right? That's nearly, uh, what, 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, with the formation of a national computer board, right? This is where at the national level, um, we, the government recognized that, that computers, you know, technology is the future, the future of urban development. And so actually established a board to ensure that we have the computer infrastructure and everything else in place for our society, our economy to be technologically progressive. Right? So 
arguably, in my mind, that's when this idea of smartness, Singapore being a smart city, actually started over the course of wisdom. Five years after that, we've had what's called the National IT Master Plan. So this is a national plan to, um, again, it's all about infrastructure development and building, putting the, the sort of uh, mechanisms in place so that the whole city will be connected up and wired. And you will not have things like internet or broadband black spots, um, which obviously even in the UK uh, are still a problem. You know, we've got whole parts of the country where um, you know, it can be difficult to, to gain internet access. So this was this was a problem that was sort of preempted many years ago, again, nearly 40 years ago, um, with the first IT master plan. Jump forward, um, you know, about 28 years or so, and we've actually got the official launch of the Smart Nation. Right? So this is when uh, 2014, this is when the government actually, um, you know, you could say jumped on the smart city bandwagon and actually packaged Singapore as a smart city and called it the smart nation. So this is when the whole idea of a smart nation, which if you think about it, us being a city state, uh, us being having one layer of government, all that kind of stuff, it actually makes sense. So this is when the actual smart nation, not the smart city, the smart nation was launched and became a, a thing in the public consciousness. And then after that, we had the formation of an organization called GovTech. Next slide, I, I promise. <laughs> I know I said next slide about two slides ago, but, but this, uh, I think it really is the next slide. I'll explain what GovTech is. Um, and then in 2017, we had the formation of SMDGA. These are two political units which are integral to the realization of Singapore as a smart nation. So, this is a kind of uh, organization chart to show you how the government in Singapore is structured to um, realize the smart city, to realize the smart nation. So at the top there, that, that sort of gray triangle is sitting on the top of the blue box, that's the prime minister's office, right? That's where DCN Lim sits, that's where the sort of the most senior cabinet people sit, that's where all the highest level decision making happens up there. What is important is that immediately below that and reporting into the prime minister's office are these two organizations that I, I've been talking about, right? On the left-hand side, as you look at the screen, that's where we've got SMDGO, that stands for the Smart Nation and Digital Governance Office. This is basically the branch of government that deals with policy, right? They do all the, they put the plans in place, they develop the policies, they, they sort of secure the funding, all that kind of stuff. Right? They look after the, the politics, the, the business side of, of politics to, to, get what, uh, to get done what needs to be done in order for the smart city to be realized. On the other side, you've got this organization called the Government Technology Agency or GovTech, right? This is essentially, uh, it's like a mini Google within government, right? So this is, it's, it's a government body, it's a government sort of agency, um, but it's, it's run, it's designed, its whole purpose is to actually build technology, right? So this is staffed, you know, mostly by engineers, data scientists, people, uh, you know, computer scientists, people that have very technical skills and they can actually build technology, right? And this is really important because uh, in many other cities around the world, they, they do not have that internal capability. And so what do they have to do? They have to outsource these decisions, these projects to the private sector, also organizations that do have the capabilities, right? Because in Singapore, we actually have that within the government structure itself. So either they're, they're building the actual solutions, the technologies themselves, or if they need to, to, you know, if they don't have the capacity, they need to go out to the private sector, they actually treat the, the private sector as equals, right? So they, they co-develop solutions together. Right? So it's not just, a, you know, we'll, we'll pay you a bunch of money and you go and develop this uh, platform to do whatever you want it to do, right? It's, we will develop this platform together as a public-private kind of partnership. And again, I will give you, uh, later I'll give you an example of, of exactly what I mean by this, okay? So this is very important. We've got these two critical agencies sitting right underneath the prime minister's office, reporting into the prime minister's office. So ensuring that the, the whole ideology, the whole sort of vision of the smart nation cascades down from the very top of government. It doesn't just happen at, at a sort of very local level where you've got issues of funding, you've got issues of uh, you know, uh, politics, people getting in the way, all this kind of stuff that, that actually block initiatives from realizing their maximum potential. 
So altogether, this is what I mean by the centralized logic of smarts in Singapore. This idea of a horizontal and vertical integration, this uh, government structure, um, this, you know, having, having as our head of state, you know, somebody who's very technologically very savvy, all of these ideas lend themselves to, to the notion that, that smartness is very centralized in Singapore. Yeah? So again, some more quotes from our interview. So on the left-hand side here, again, we've got the permanent secretary of SMDGO. Now we all know what SMDGO is, uh, thankfully. Um, as, as he said, uh, our prime minister is very technically savvy. He codes, he's our greatest mystery shopper. He doesn't just have a vision, he actually goes down into the nitty-gritty details of how technology is used by people. He's always been at the forefront of what it takes to use technology well. Uh, and then on the other side, on the right-hand side, we've got the founding CEO of GovTech um, saying that uh, this is, she was the founding CEO of the lady. Um, and she said that it actually centralizes our computerization function. So from GovTech, you, you have one entity that provides the CIA, the chief information officers, the 60 plus ministries and agencies, right? So again, we've got those ideas of centralization coming through very strongly, where all the CIOs, they're not competing against each other within different agencies and ministries. They all come from one, and then they're seconded out to different branches of the government so that they can all work together in an integrated way, essentially. And this is what GovTech looks like. Yeah, you know, I told you that um, it was like a mini Google within governments. Um, I don't know, I, I've been into a few government offices in the UK. Um, I've been into a few in Singapore. Um, I've never actually been to GovTech, as I said, when we were doing these, this research, um, most, it was during COVID, so most of the interviews were actually done online. Um, so I've never been here, but I, I trust that it actually looks like this. Um, but this is not what the standard government office looks like in Singapore. I promise you that. Um, just last week, I, was giving, uh, I gave a different presentation to uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs in their offices, and it is not like this at all. It's cubicles, it's, it's very gray and blue, and you know, everyone wearing sort of white shirts and, and ties and black trousers that are tucked in, and nicely combed hair, and oh, you know, typical sort of government machinery of the state kind of look and feel. GovTech is designed to be different, right? It's meant to be different. It's meant to be a place, not that isn't sort of the typical state apparatus of bureaucracy, decision-making, things happen really slowly, um, and so very hierarchical and so on and so forth, right? GovTech is meant to be like a startup. It's meant to be agile. It's meant to be risk. Uh, it's meant to embrace risk. Um, it's meant to be a much better hierarchy. It's meant to give people, engineers, the freedom that they need to experiment and to do their jobs well, right? So beyond, it goes beyond just the aesthetics of what an office looks like. Uh, it's actually sort of meant to integrate this ethos of the private sector into the state, into the government itself. Again, uh, I will, in the next part of this presentation, I'll ask give some more concrete examples of what I mean by this. So this is a systems engineer, quite a quite a, a sort of entry level guy. I think there's a fresh graduate just talking about GovTech. Right? So what he said is that lots of people are attracted to the startup culture of GovTech, the startup branding that GovTech has, and therefore we're able to attract the right people with the type of skills they're needed, but also the impetus to change them. If you're housed under or within a very bureaucratic organization, they not, might not be able to affect the change that they want to, and they're, they're dissatisfied. They end up leaving. Right? The GovTech by design is meant to be different from the rest of the government. Okay, that's the first part. Let me now turn to the second part, which is looking at this idea of insource, right? And this is the idea that actually having a GovTech uh, within the Singapore government does not just emerge or appear organically, right? Um, it actually takes a lot of effort and a lot of planning and a lot of, sort of strategic thinking to make it what it is, to actually create this idea of GovTech, of Google within the Singapore government. And the logic upon which this is based is this idea of insource, bringing in the talent we need to from the private sector, from overseas, into the Singapore government. Um, so I'll show you what I, what I mean by this, this idea of insource. Again, this, this, why this is novel, why this is interesting, is because it basically um, flips on its head the whole logic or premise upon which many smart cities around the world are based, which is the logic of outsourcing, which is governments, public sector organizations are not meant to be innovative. They're not meant to be able to build tech. They're not meant to build this stuff until they have to look to the private sector. They outsource projects to the private sector. Whereas in Singapore, 
it's the opposite, not to be. So they've embraced this model because outsourcing is an inherently a very risky model. You're looking at two entities where their, their um, motivations and their you know, the incentive structures are very much misaligned. Right? And for the governments, you're looking at something which is looking at civic good and the good of society and the people and, and those sorts of things. With the private sector, if you're outsourcing to the private sector, they're essentially profit most based. So you've got this sort of misalignment. So these are just two quotes of showing you the, the risks of outsourcing. So on the left here, the permanent secretary of, of, uh, of SMDGO, um, what he's saying is that there's um, a risk of not, if you don't have the technological capacity within the organization, um, it's, it can be very risky talking to private sector vendors. So as he says, the highlighted part, as we start to invest a lot more in ICTs and smart systems, we know what we're talking about. We can hold the vendors to doing a good job. And on the right there, even within DDS, which is a private sector organization, the CIO, actually the former CIO, what he said is that nobody's going, if you're, if you're going down this outsourcing model, nobody is going to innovate for you. If fundamentally you want to become a digital company, you need to create, create that DNA, the technology DNA within DDS. You need to bring people in to drive this change from the vendors. So there's a few ways in which uh, GovTech goes about doing this, about insourcing talent, right? So um, the sort of the, the images to the left of the screen, they show you various programs that they put in place. So the middle one there, technology associate program, this is basically the graduate scheme for, for computer scientists and so on. What's more interesting is the one to the bottom, in the bottom left there, which is actually a smart nation fellowship. And I'll explain a little more, more what that is. Um, but what the, the data, the, what the, the quote on the right says, this is from the CEO of GovTech, is, is that actually if you're looking for real tech people in Singapore, it's very hard to find them. They're not really tech, they're business product development, project management, consultancy and all that. They're not the real tech people. It's because in Singapore for many decades, if you wanted to be a tech person and you wanted to build your career and to actually advance your career, you actually needed to move out of technology and into these more generic business functions. Yeah. But what he says is that if you want to be real tech, you're likely to end up with the Googles and Facebooks in Silicon Valley. So as a result of that, this is what they would do. Uh, this is what the government would do. So you'll recognize the man in the white shirt here as Lucien Lung, the prime minister. This is him actually in Silicon Valley talking to a bunch of Singaporeans that work there for big tech companies, right? Telling them about what they're doing in terms of the smart nation, uh, inviting them to come back and work for GovTech if they want to do something different, if they want to change in their career. So he's, he's you know, arguably leading these kind of recruitment efforts to try and get Singaporeans to actually, who are working in, in sort of big tech in, in the US and in other countries around, around the world, to actually come back to Singapore and to, to come and work for GovTech. So this is um, one of the programs that I, I sort of briefly mentioned uh, a couple of slides ago, it's this idea of the Smart Nation Fellowship Program. So this is where people that are working in the private sector or working in any other organization, startups or whatever, um, not in GovTech, they can actually take a fellowship and, and spend a few months or however long it is to work in GovTech and actually get a feel for what it's all about. Yeah. So this is a quote from, from a, he was a former Smart Nation Fellow, so he did this, this fellowship, and then he actually realized that this is something that, that's of interest to him, and he actually joined full time and became a distinguished engineer. Yes. So what he said is that I have an interest in smart nation, but also mod modernizing government technology. That was what interested him originally, that kind of civic tech and all those sorts of things. And he wanted to contribute back, he wanted to do something that actually has an impact, rather than just sort of being profit motivated, wanting money uh, to make money, they actually wanted to, um, to do something that, that gave back to society and to Singapore. What's interesting is that this guy, um, he's not Singaporean, he's actually Australian. So this is an Australian guy wanting to, um, to give back, not do it in Australia because, because of the centralization uh, factors of Singapore, uh, in Australia you don't have that. So not to do it in Australia, because you wouldn't be able to realize that vision, that motivation for what you had, but to do it in Singapore instead. 
So this is him again on the left-hand side. What he says is that Singapore is a little bit of an exemplar in some ways of how a smart nation can be run. If I was back in Australia, I'd never consider working for the government. I've got good friends who work in Australia in that sense, and the government's name technology, and this is a nightmare, right? Things cannot get done. They do not have a government equivalent organization, um, so they cannot affect the change that they would want to um, in, in Australia. Whereas in Singapore, the way that the government is set up, the way that the smart city, the smart nation is set up, they can actually do that. The quotes on the right, these are just um, from a bunch of relatively new uh, sort of graduate level or, or you know, very early career um, trainees into GovTech saying, um, why I've included them here is they kind of give you a sense of the ethos of young Singaporeans. So all of them say, never been driven for profit, an interest in tech for good and helping fellow citizens. We all work for Singapore. We're trying to bring as much value as we can to Singapore citizens. So beyond just insourcing talent, you know, tech skills, tech talents, uh, people to, to do these jobs, what's also happening is that we're insourcing this idea of civic mindedness. Right? People in government developing these solutions that are designed to help um, their, their fellow citizens as best they can. Again, not something you necessarily get with an outsourcing model. Okay, third part. Um, I'm mindful of time. I, I've got a what is it, 38. Yeah, I've got about seven minutes left uh, before we hit 45. So um, I think I'm actually on in pretty good shape. I've, I've been, been sort of moderating myself quite well. So um, so hopefully we I won't need to speed up too much. But this is the the final part of the presentation. Just looking at this idea of how we might be uh, reimagining the idea of the smart city through um, an understanding of the Singapore case. So what we're seeing as a result of centralization, the first thing I talked about, as a result of influencing, the second thing I talked about, what we're seeing is this is a, is a case study, is a context in which the public sector is really leading innovation. Yeah? It's not something that's outsourced, it's not something that comes from the private sector, it's something that's driven by the government, by the, uh, by the public sector. Yeah. What the what the, the CEO of GovTech is saying is that um, uh, you know this is when they do actually partner with industry to, to develop projects. And so through that partnership, there's a transfer of skills on both sides. And that helps to raise the bar on the overall technical capabilities of the workforce. Yeah. And then going further, the CEO also says that GovTech allows companies to build on our infrastructure and in fact they extend our infrastructure. When you think about it, one of the values of the government is that we create a very trusted environment. We're a part of which competitors will feel comfortable working with. On their own, they probably wouldn't want to because of data sharing, because of trust and all of that. So we have a powerful, trusted, convening role to bring people together, and that extends to the private sector also. So this, this sort of uh, last quote on, on the right of the screen, this is what I'm getting at when I talk about this idea of state-led platformization, right? Innovation starts from the state, and because the, the state in Singapore plays a very large role, um, it creates this very large, significant, trusted environment, which competitors, whether they're banks, whether they're shipping companies, whether they're, they're different you know, healthcare providers, whatever it may be, they feel safe, safe collaborating with each other, not just competing, but collaborating with each other if the government is there in the center of it, playing a sort of centralized role. Yeah? So through that, because it's the government actually getting these uh, entities, which might otherwise be competitors, to actually collaborate together, the potential, the scope of what they can do ma magnifies, increases massively. So this is an example of what I mean by that. And, and if you remember the third paper that I developed, it's looking at the idea of this idea of state-led platformization. Um, this is a very good example of what I mean by state-led platformization. Of this idea of the government sort of at the center creating this trusted ecosystem through which different private sector players can work together, overcome silos, overcome differences, uh, and so forth. So this is called SG Traders. Um, and this is um, this draws on actually Singapore's island geography as well. This is you know, Singapore is actually historically been a trading hub, and that's uh, you know a big chunk of the economy. Uh, comes from trade, you know, facilitating trade and so forth. So actually making process of, the process of trading uh, more efficient and more convenient and faster and cheaper and all this stuff stuff, 
actually helps to, to, to boost the economy. So this is a quote from one of the managing directors, one of the heads of business of BBS Bank, talking about XG trading. I'll just quickly run through this. So he narrates it quite well. He told us that one of the biggest hurdles in trade is that data is fragmented. The issuing bank of a letter of credit and the receiving bank of a letter of credit have different states of information. Shipping carriers have different pieces of information. The port has a different piece of information. The customer has a different piece of information. And then the supplier has got the actual in invoice, right? So it's messy, it's all over the place, it's fragmented, it's completely decentralized, it's just a mess and nightmare. So one of the things that Singapore TradeX, SG TradeX does, is they built a common data infrastructure for all classes in the supply chain to submit information into a common data infrastructure, right? So all of these different agencies, the banks, the, um, the supplying banks, the receiving banks, the, the shipper, the ports, the customer, the provider of the, of the goods, you know, all, the, all these different parties, they're coming together and putting data into one centralized data repository, yep. They can now put information into a single database called CDI, which is part of the SGT for traders, common data infrastructure. This is the government bringing all these things together, bringing all the players together so that they can actually do that, creating this trusted ecosystem, this trusted platform through which otherwise competitive or suspicious or, or, or entities that would have no real motivation to share information is creating this environment in which they can do it. Okay. Another very good example, slightly scary example, is this idea of um, SG Findex, right? So this is more to do with personal finance. And so um, what SG Findex is, is the same principle. It's a state-led platform. And what they do is they, they aggregate all of your financial information, the different banks, or you know, all your different banks in Singapore, your different investment holdings, your um, CPF account, which is like a Providence fund, your insurance policies, you know, whatever it may be, whatever, whatever sort of personal finance account or, or um, thing you have uh, with the with agencies in Singapore, ST Findex brings them all together and it gives you this really scary, sort of uncompromising snapshot of your net worth, right? So if you add up all of your, you know, we all have some fragmented uh, financial lives, right? But if you sort of take a snapshot and balance all your all your assets over all of your liabilities, how much you actually work. <laughs> it's, like it's really, really scary to actually look at it. But again, this is a good example of the Singapore government putting itself at the center of innovation, the center of the platform, and creating a um, tradition, a situation, an environment through which um, otherwise competing organizations can work together to innovate, to provide a solution. Okay, that's it. Um, I, I noticed that I'm sort of bang on time. It's, it's eight quarter four according to me. So um, I, I feel quite shocked that I, I didn't overrun too much. Um, thank you for listening to me. I think we, we've now got about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, as I, if well, I, yeah, sorry, I, no. sorry. I was gonna say, thanks for being exactly on time. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, if I could start off as, uh, as chair, um, the uh, two aspects of this, I mean, I've learned a lot more about Singapore than, uh, than I know, particularly about uh, its, its uh, uh, positioning itself as a smart city. Uh, I'm just wondering in terms of uh, two things. So um, when you have countries, if, if you have a country of a certain scale, uh, you have different major cities that can position themselves as a global city, matching up, you know, investing in some new wave of technology and then if you have another wave technology, we know that's going to keep on increasing the pace that this just change happens globally. Uh, you, you don't have to rely on one city keeping up all the time. Singapore has to because it's one city, one state. So there's. it, it seems to me that part of this is uh, in uh, uh, investing in always being cutting edge. That's what Singapore has to do. It has to keep up with each and every wave. It doesn't have the choice otherwise. So there's partly a material concern. Um, the other thing I was wondering is the about is the political side. So you can comment on that. That um, when you have uh, its positioning as a global, it, you have you mentioned that it has vertical integration in terms of government, and uh, you would normally have national domestic concerns, but then you'd have interests that are more global in their aspirations, and these often don't match up. So you have things like them being upset about foreign talent, local labor worried about foreign talent. Or too many, too many mainland Chinese, as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, straight born, you know, th this kind of thing. 
uh, and that's part of the necessity, right? That's part of the that part of the politics of this creating an imaginary that everybody accepts that there's problems right now, but these guys at the top are so smart. Whatever they're planning for the future, that's what we go with because it's gonna it's gonna work out for everybody. And I wonder if you could comment. Well, there, there are less comments than or uh, questions and comments. Yeah, no, no, those are great sort of observations, Mike. Thank you for those. Um, that first point about always being cutting edge. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's true. You know, there is this kind of pressure. I mean, that being said, what's interesting is that there is a, I wouldn't say humility, but the Singapore does look to other cities for like, for um, best practices that it could emulate or copy or adapt to the Singapore state, to the Singapore context. Especially when, um, you know, in the sort of more formative years of GovTech. Uh, um, so Estonia um, has, has, is remarkably progressive. This is one of the, it's maybe surprising, it's maybe a little bit surprising, but Estonia has a very good reputation for having a national identity infrastructure way before anybody else. So these, the, you know, the leader of GovTech and, and SMBJ, they would always say and talk about Estonia in somewhere that they always emulated. And actually, when it comes to national digital identity, Singapore actually is, is sort of a few steps behind uh, where it could be. Um, also, actually, surprisingly, I, I'm British, but um, the UK, uh, the UK does some things uh, really well. I can't remember the top of my head what they are. But again, it's, it's a sort of data infrastructure about the sharing of information and things like that. Um, so there's a, there is always this interreferencing going on about taking ideas, bringing them in. Um, Singapore tries to, to I mean, the, the language that we always use there is that of the hub, right? the hub for this, for that, for everything. So, um, and it tries to do that for the um, sort of narratives and discourses on the smart city as well. So it tries to be a sort of hub that integrates global ideas, that brings city leaders from around the world together, for summits and for sharing and for workshops and, and all that kind of stuff. And then what's interesting, and this speaks to actually the um, project that I just started in the last year, is uh, how it actually uses that and puts it out into the region, right? The, our, our, our garden, you could say, our backyard, right? Um, the Southeast Asia, which is where actually Singapore sort of, it, it would never say this overtly, but that is its market to go and actually sell services, to go and actually play an interventionist role in helping, uh, you know, cities around the region in, in sort of, managing and, and going through this journey towards becoming smart, however that that's defined in, in different contexts. So it is interesting that this translation of ideas from bringing them into Singapore and getting them to work in Singapore, but then also taking them out of Singapore and applying them to the region, the regions and markets um, and things like that. But let me just comment briefly on your second point, which is the political side, which again is, is a very accurate and um, astute observation. I will just sort of speak to it um, by giving one example of vignettes, which is um, actually what happened during COVID. So one of my critiques of myself with this presentation is that I'm not critical at all. Very just, um, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, I'm just giving you the, the, all the good stuff. Um, but obviously there, there is a very critical discourse around the role of the state in society and public life and, and a singular unitary definition of what a smart city is and so on and so forth, so I'm fully aware of that. And so the point is, there are significant social groups that are sort of marginalized by the narrative of smartness, by, by the smart nation. One of those is the elderly, the other one is uh, hawkers. So in Singapore, we have a lot of hawker centers and people that sell um, some street food within designated areas, very cheap, very tasty, very good, all this kind of stuff. But for a long time, they resisted, um, the government tried to push them, but they resisted uh, taking on e-payment services, right? So the government wants to roll out a nationwide e-payment platform, right? To get all hawkers to stop using cash and just use e-payment. And they didn't want to do that because a lot of them are sort of traditionally Chinese educated, traditional, they like money, you know, physical money. They, they just didn't want to do it. There are barriers, so many barriers to up to What happened during COVID is that actually COVID gave the government the perfect opportunity to just bulldoze through all of these complaints. We did in Singapore, as I'm sure, you know, as you did in the UK and then everywhere else did basically in the world. Uh, you know, we have very tight restrictions on safe distancing and, and safe management measures and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it got to the point where we, you were not allowed to go to hawker centres or you could go and buy food, but you couldn't eat at hawker centres and you couldn't use, you know, do all this kind of stuff. And so that was, what, that was the excuse the government used to roll out this 
payment infrastructure throughout the whole percentage because it's cashless money, so it's good because you're not transmitting viruses or anything like that. So it was it was very effective. And actually, that I mean that's just one example. The COVID-19 really provided the conditions through which a lot of aspects of the smart nation that were had experienced obstacles, they managed to, to sort of clear them away and push through a lot of things. So I guess you know there is a very, very clear contentious political side to this story, which I haven't addressed really at all in this presentation. But I'm going to... I, I've noticed myself all the cash, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> cashless payment yeah. uh, requirements that are happening today in Singapore. When I was there. Uh, we have two comments from or two questions from our attendees. Uh, I'll just give you them both, and if you could answer them in turn. Uh, if you were if you were to put GovTech Singapore GDS UK USDS CDS Canada on a spectrum, say for effectiveness, efficiency, and or impact, where would you place them? <laughs> the the second comment is thanks for your presentation. It's very inspiring. Excavation march. My question is how to distinguish civic mindedness in Singapore from a kind of nationalism under the manipulation of the centralized tech system. Thank you both. Um, two, well, two good questions. Well, I will give you one good answer, and one really rubbish answer. So the rubbish answer is for the first one, um, because I do not know much or anything about GDS, although it is, it is, as I mentioned, it's highly regarded in Singapore. It's something that has been looked up to for the US version. The Canadian one is really interesting, because as I said, this project is actually funded, or the project that this presentation is from, is actually funded out of Canada. And so we have a lot of collaborators um, in Canada, in Calgary, in Toronto, uh, in Montreal, do it, developing case studies of their respective cities. Um, and actually last year in Singapore, in I think it was October, we, we held a workshop in Singapore where we brought all of the project team members working on different cities from around the world to Singapore and talked about you know, the particularities of our particular cases. Right? Um, what was working well, what, was, you know, what wasn't, and, and we tried to develop this sort of comparative understanding of smart city development. Um, obviously, I, I gave our Singapore presentation. It was all, it was all, you know, the good news that I've been giving you uh, today for you know, this afternoon. Um, but what was interesting is that our, our, our colleagues in Canada, um, it was very, very, very much a different story. Uh, you know, so many problems. A lot of them because the situation is the opposite of what I've been talking about in relation to Singapore. So decentralization, outsourcing. Um, you know, the the fact that innovation comes from the private sector, maybe the people, maybe it's more society driven, but the public sector doesn't really. So um, I, I don't know anything. I'd say, you know, say, uh, say Singapore is first, or it's certainly towards the front. I would say the GDS, and this is simply because when we were interviewing a lot of people in Singapore, they, they did mention the GDS in the UK as, as, as a sort of uh, an example of some, an organization that got it right. So they're up there as well. US, I do not know about, so I cannot comment. And then Canada from our, our colleagues uh, in Canada, probably <laughs> towards, towards the end. So that's a bad answer. I hope, I hope it's sort of somehow satisfied you. Um, Dylan, thank you for your um, point. Yeah, so, so how do I distinguish civic mindedness and the kind of nationalism under the manipulators? Yeah, so, so this is also, this is the flip side of the, um, you know, our saying that there's a long tail to smartness. And this sort of technocratic way of thinking, it's, it become, it's so embedded throughout society. It's embedded through various uh, infrastructures, through various institutions, which are cornerstone of Singapore. Uh, I'll give you two, which I think are, are sort of fundamental. One is public housing, uh, the HDB. Um, so Singapore is unique in that we have 80 to 90% of the population here living in public housing. Um, you know, we do have private housing condominiums and, and um, we call them landed properties here, but the vast majority of people live in public housing. And that creates, there's a certain, you know, this public housing is great. It's very cheap. It's, it's amazing, you know, to, to, if you can buy one and, and get access to the HDB system. Um, but it's also very controlling. There's a lot of rules and regulations and you get these people living together and there's a lot of sort of in, inter-family surveillance and uh, you get these kind of residence uh, committees, this weird sort of hierarchy within, within different blocks. Um, so there are lots of mechanisms like that, where this sort of surveillance and this sort of um, 
training into a way of thinking and behaving. It's it's pervasive throughout life. So that's one sort of way in this in which this very technocratic ethos is sort of embedded within the population. The other is the education system. Um, so then I, I don't know if you are Singaporean or, or not, but um, you know, throughout the, the education system, there, there's a there's this course or this sort of emphasis on national education, national values. Again, sort of uh, getting Singaporeans from a young age to understand the, the values and the advantages of the Singapore system. So I don't I don't think it is. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult to distinguish um, this kind of nationalism with civic mindedness. That being said, I would also sort of um, sort of caveat that you know a lot. We we spoke to a few recent graduates, so so young Singaporeans in sort of their twenties, mid twenties, first jobs, you know, that kind of stuff. And for them, they have a lot of options. They they can you know they're technically trained. They could go. And, they're interviewing with Google. They're interviewing with Amazon. And, you know, um, all these kind of you know, big tech companies, and so they have a lot of options, and they can sort of do what they want. You know, the world is their oyster. But despite all these options, they choose to work for government. And you know, that's how do you explain? How do you rationalize that choice? Um, if they were purely, um, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is maybe this is the the pinnacle of that sort of uh, confluence of civic mindedness and nationalism coming together. And actually, I'd rather work for government than I would Google. Um, but still, it's, it strikes me as, as a little bit strange. I think that there is something more genuine there. Um, there. In Singapore, there's always this narrative of, of existential threat and, and you know, survivalist mindset. Uh, and I think you know, there is something kind of interesting there. And then the other sort of caveat to that is um, the Australian guy that I, I mentioned. I provided some quotes from him, uh, which is, you know, how do you explain him uh, again, reiterating the same kind of, of rhetoric. Um, he's, I think he might be a permanent resident, but um, he doesn't have to, to you know, say that he wants to give back to Singapore. And, and he wouldn't have got, he didn't go through the whole education. He doesn't live in an HDB. He's very wealthy. He's started up and sold off many companies in his career and stuff. Um, so how do you explain that as well? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, it's something that, that I haven't explored directly in this research, but something that I think will become more important and more sort of pressing as we, as we continue, continue to progress in, in our journey. In um, yeah, thank you. Okay, we're just at the end of the hour. So I, I think what we'll, we'll end with the very last comment uh, that's been put up. Thank you, very informative. Oh, thank you. Thank you for Thank you. spending your, your lunch signs to me. Thank you very much. And um, we, will, uh, we will sign off now. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Woods, for your very interesting talk. And uh, thank all of you, our attendees, for, uh, for, uh, for attending. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.